Hello, this is Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. Today, I will be discussing heart sounds. Here are the learning objectives of this lecture. First, to be able to recognize abnormalities of S1 and S2, as well as the presence of pathologic heart sounds such as S3, S4, and others. Next, to know the differential diagnosis for these abnormal sounds. Finally, to be familiar with some of the scientific evidence for their use in clinical diagnosis. While I won't be focusing on exam technique per se during this lecture, I will start by saying that appreciating heart sounds is difficult. An abnormal splitting of S2, or a soft gallop, are very subtle findings. In my opinion, the most common reason a clinician misses these types of sounds are because not enough time is spent with a stethoscope on the patient's chest. Listening for only a few seconds at each of the four classic valve areas is not adequate. Instead, it may be necessary to spend 20, 30, or even 60 seconds listening to each component of the cardiac cycle at each location of auscultation. If in the course of your practice, it rarely feels like an awkwardly long time is spent listening to a patient's chest, you are probably not listening long enough. So here is a basic schematic of the heart with the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle shown. Then here are our four valves, the tricuspid, the pulmonic, the aortic, and the mitral. The first of the two normal sounds is called S1. S1 is caused by and occurs essentially simultaneous to the closing of the mitral and tricuspid valves at the transition from diastole to systole. The second normal heart sound is called S2. S2 is caused by and occurs essentially simultaneous to the closing of the aortic and pulmonic valves at the transition from systole back to diastole. Together, S1 and S2 form the lub-dub of the heartbeat. Both S1 and S2 are relatively high-pitched sounds. Although the pitch of S2 can be lower than S1, both are still best heard with a diaphragm of the stethoscope. Let's take a closer look at each. The intensity of S1 is predominantly determined by its mitral valve component. Therefore, it is loudest at the apex, just over the mitral valve. The intensity of S1 is related to the speed with which the valve closes, which is largely determined by the strength of the left ventricular contraction at the moment of closure. There are three basic classes of abnormalities of S1 intensity. First is an unusually loud S1. This can be caused by a short PR interval, mild mitral stenosis, and hyperdynamic states. The recognition that mild MS can lead to a loud S1 is particularly important as this finding is typically easier to detect than its associated soft diastolic rumbling murmur. Next is a soft S1. This can be caused by a long PR interval, severe mitral stenosis where the mitral valves are calcified and stiff, and a left bundle branch block. In addition, any pathology that interferes with transmission of sound from the heart through the chest wall will also lead to a soft S1. This includes COPD, obesity, and a pericardial effusion. Finally is a variable S1. This can be caused by AV dissociation, where a variable relationship between LV and LA pressures leads to variable speeds of mitral valve closure. Here is a recording from a patient in complete heart block and its associated AV dissociation. Atrial fibrillation leads to variable intensity uh, due to varying RR intervals and thus varying strengths of contraction. While these two lead to an unpredictable pattern of intensity variation, a large pericardial effusion and severe LV dysfunction can lead to a pattern in which a relatively loud S1 alternates with a relatively soft S1. 
This unusual finding is known as oscillatory alternance and is the correlate to pulses alternance, where every other pulse is strong, alternating with weak ones. You might be wondering how the PR interval can affect the intensity of S1. Here are two uh, simple graphs to show why this happens. In the first, we have a graph of pressure versus time in the cardiac chambers for a patient with a short PR interval. The graph will focus on just the transition point between diastole and systole. In blue is the left atrial pressure with the sudden rise due to the atrial kick. The red line is the left ventricular pressure, which has a sudden rise at the onset of systole, which occurs just after the onset of the QRS complex. Remember that the intensity of S1 depends upon the speed with which the mitral valve closes, which is partly dependent upon the strength of left ventricular contraction at the moment left ventricular pressure exceeds left atrial pressure. That is, the force of LV contraction at the moment the mitral valve closes. When the PR interval is short, the relative force of contraction is high, which can be estimated by the slope of the LV pressure tracing versus time uh, at the moment LV and LA pressures are equal. In the second graph, we see the situation with a long PR interval. In this case, the left ventricle is still in its early, still accelerating phase of contraction when its pressure exceeds that in the left atrium. Therefore, the slope of this curve here is relatively less, which will result in a relatively softer S1. Let's now talk about S2. To remind you, S2 is a relatively high-pitched sound occurring at the transition from systole to diastole. It is easiest to hear at the uh, upper sternal border, and it is normally split during inspiration. This means that the contributions to S2 from the aortic and pulmonic valves are not simultaneous. Here is a schematic of the normal heart sounds, including the splitting of S2 during inspiration. You can see that the individual components of S2 are named A2 for the sound originating from the aortic valve, and P2 for the sound originating from the pulmonic valve. Take a listen. The varying timing of A2 and P2 throughout the respiratory cycle is a function of two changes that occur during inspiration. First, the lower interthoracic pressure during inspiration leads to increased right ventricular preload, which then increases the duration of RV systole, thus delaying P2. Second, the decreased LV preload during inspiration leads to shorter LV systole, and therefore an earlier A2. There are many different abnormalities of the splitting of S2. I'm going to quickly run through five of them. For reference, here is the normal S2 split. Next, we can have a wide split where S2 is mildly split during expiration and more dramatically split during inspiration. This can be caused by anything that either delays RV contraction and thus P2, makes LV contraction in A2 premature, increasing RV afterload, or decreases LV afterload. The list of etiologies here include right bundle branch block, pre-excitation of the LV as seen in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, pulmonary hypertension, massive PE, severe mitral regurgitation, and constrictive pericarditis. Take a listen to what this sounds like. Another abnormality is a fixed splitting of S2. In this scenario, S2 is split equally in inspiration and expiration. It is most commonly described in the setting of a large ASD, or atrial septal defect, but is also described in severe RV failure. 
This situation in which the split is heard during expiration and not during inspiration is known as a reversed or paradoxical split. It is, in some ways, the inverse of the wide split. Therefore, its causes include a left bundle branch block, pre-excitation of the RV, seen in either WPW or during uh, right ventricular pacing, aortic valve disease, and the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. An absent A2, which will manifest as an absent split, can be seen in severe aortic valve disease, such as severe calcific aortic stenosis, and a fused A2 and P2 throughout the respiratory cycle will also manifest as an absent split, and this can be seen with a VSD with Eisenmenger syndrome or a single ventricle. These last two abnormalities, the absent A2 and fused A2P2, are very similar acoustically, but uh, differ greatly in their patient populations. The former is heard almost solely in the elderly, while the latter is heard almost solely in the pediatric ages. The only other abnormality of S2 that I'll mention here is an unusually loud P2. P2 is usually softer than A2 and is usually absent entirely when one is auscultating at the apex. However, a P2 that is louder than A2, or one that is easily audible at the apex, is suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. Take a listen here. At this point, I'm going to shift from talking about abnormal variants of the normal heart sounds to talking about sounds whose very existences are considered abnormal. The first and most important in this category is the third heart sound, usually called the S3. The S3 is a low-pitched, early diastolic sound. It is easiest to hear at the apex with the patient in the left lateral decubitus position. Although it is occasionally heard in young healthy people and pregnant women, in those over the age of 40, it is usually pathologic and indicative of left ventricular failure. The actual mechanism by which a pathologic S3 is generated is not completely known, but is probably related to an abrupt deceleration of blood as it attempts to fill a failing ventricle, resulting in vibration of the ventricular walls. Here's a schematic and audio clip of how S3 relates to the other oscillatory components of the heart. The fourth heart sound, or S4, is next. This is a low-pitched, late diastolic sound, sometimes referred to as a pre-systolic sound. It is always pathologic and is thought to be caused by atrial contraction into a stiff and non-compliant ventricle, as might occur with systemic hypertension, LVH, or ischemic cardiomyopathy. An S4 has been rarely described in patients in atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, although the mechanism for this has not been explained. Here's a schematic and audio clip. Occasionally, some clinicians will refer to S3 and S4 as gallops. More specifically, a ventricular gallop is an S3 and an atrial gallop is an S4. On rare occasions, one might come across the term summation gallop. This is used to describe the situation in which an S3 and S4 are superimposed on one another during tachycardia.
This occurs as a consequence of the fact that as the heart speeds up, the part of the cardiac cycle to be most responsible for its shortening is the time between rapid phase of ventricular relaxation in early diastole and the atrial kick in late diastole. Eventually, that period of time will become so short that S3 and S4 merge together, and one can no longer be sure if an S3 is present and S4 is present, or both. This may make more sense to hear. First, here is a patient with both an S3 and an S4 at a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, with a recording made during expiration and thus without an S2 split. Here is the same patient with an S3 and S4 at a rate of 80 beats a minute. And now at a rate of 100. Finally, here he is at a rate of 120. At this point, the extra sounds in diastole have fused, and it is no longer possible to distinguish one from the other, or even be sure how many sounds exist. Gallops usually originate from the left side of the heart, but can on occasion originate from the right side as well. Aside from a slight difference in location where they are best appreciated, left and right gallops can be dif also differentiated by the effect of respiration. The most common left-sided gallops heard in CHF get softer with inspiration, while the rarer right-sided gallops, for example a right-sided S3 in a massive pulmonary embolism, get louder with inspiration. In addition to gallops, another general category of abnormal heart sounds are called clicks. There are two important ones of which a clinician should be aware, the aortic ejection click and the mitral valve prolapse click. The aortic ejection click occurs very early in systole and corresponds to the opening of the aortic valve. It is high-pitched, can usually be heard everywhere if audible at all, and is not affected by the patient standing. The presence of an ejection click makes any associated systolic crescendo-decrescendo murmur highly likely to indicate pathology of the aortic valve as opposed to being a simple and benign flow murmur. The MVP click, on the other hand, occurs during mid-systole, caused by prolapse of one of the mitral valve leaflets. It is also high-pitched, but typically audible only at the apex. For the patient with an MVP click, it will occur earlier in systole upon standing. These two sounds are called clicks because they are extremely brief and crisp in sound, unlike S1 through S4, which tend to reverberate for a period of time. An S1 or S2 that is produced by a mechanical valve replacement will acoustically sound similar to a click and is occasionally referred to as such. For example, a mechanical S2 click after an aortic valve replacement. The absence of an audible mechanical valve click in a patient who has received a mechanical valve may be an indicator of valve dysfunction. I'll give you an example of a mechanical AVR click. First, I'll play a normal S1 and S2, so those sounds are fresh in your mind for comparison. Now here is a patient with a mechanical aortic valve. At this point, I'd like to actually go back and revisit S1 for a minute. Although I had discussed in some detail the splitting of S2, I hadn't previously mentioned that S1 can actually be split as well. The normal split of S1 is usually very narrow and combined with the fact that the tricuspid component is very soft is usually not appreciable. 
However, from time to time, you will encounter a patient who sounds to have a prominently split S1. There are three common explanations. First, S1 is actually split. This usually means that the tricuspid valve closure is delayed relative to the mitral valve closure for some reason. This could be due to a right bundle branch block, pre-excitation, or an idioventricular rhythm arising from the left ventricle. The second explanation is that the first component of the split is actually an S4 and not part of the S1. The third explanation is that the second component is actually an aortic ejection click. It can be difficult to distinguish between these three possibilities, but there can be a few hints. For a truly split S1, both components of the split will be high-pitched, and the split is best appreciated at the left lower sternal border. For an S4 mimicking a split S1, the first component will be low-pitched, and the second will be high. The splitting here will be best appreciated at the apex. Finally, for an aortic ejection click, both components will be high-pitched, but the split can usually be heard equally well in all cardiac areas. There are three more pathologic heart sounds which you may hear about from time to time. I will describe them only briefly as they are all very uncommon. First, an opening snap is a low-pitched early diastolic sound heard in mitral stenosis, presumably caused by a sudden opening of the abnormal mitral valve leaflets. The pericardial knock is a sound acoustically similar to an S3 that can be heard in constrictive pericarditis. It is sometimes described as being slightly higher pitched and occurring earlier in diastole than S3, and other times the two are described as being indistinguishable. Last, the tumor plop is a low-pitched early diastolic sound occasionally heard in the presence of an atrial myxoma. It occurs when a relatively mobile tumor moves in front of the mitral valve during diastole. It can cause a functional mitral stenosis and may be followed by a low-pitched diastolic murmur similar to MS. Now I would like to shift gears completely and discuss what the evidence is for using these sounds in a clinical diagnosis. Unfortunately, the majority of the scientific literature on heart sounds focuses on basic physiology, often doing experiments on dogs or other non-human animals in order to understand what causes the various sounds. And of the literature on human subjects, much is from the period of uh, 1950s and 1960s, and therefore predominantly included patients with severe valvular disease and complex congenital heart disease. Today, these situations are usually identified early via echocardiography and are surgically corrected before abnormalities of the heart sounds are apparent and relevant. Thus, these studies, which may have been critically important at one time, are not really any, any longer appropriate to consider within the context of modern clinical practice. Overall, there is a relative lack of contemporary data that focuses on how to use the presence or absence of a particular abnormality of the heart sounds to increase or decrease the chance that a pathologic process is present, but there is some. The first question I will address is how accurate an S1 of variable intensity is at detecting AV dissociation. This was investigated by one paper back in 1994. Uh, the study protocol was a bit complicated, but in summary, 21 patients who lacked significant structural heart disease, but who had temporary dual chamber pacing in the context of an EP procedure, were randomized to either having standard AV sequential pacing or having AV dissociation artificially induced. Each was then examined by multiple clinicians for several physical exam findings, including a variable intensity of S1. The authors found a sensitivity of 58% and specificity of 98%. This translated to an impressive positive likelihood ratio of 24.4 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.4. Therefore, the presence of a variable S1 was highly predictive of AV dissociation, and its absence of a variable S1 was modestly predictive of the absence of AV dissociation. It's important to note that this study was small and included patients with structurally normal hearts who are uncommon to get AV dissociation in a more natural setting.
there's also some limited data on the utility of using an abnormal S2 to diagnose significant aortic stenosis. A 1987 study took 75 elderly nursing home patients who had aortic systolic ejection murmurs previously noted. The average age of them was 83 years. All were given a thorough cardiovascular exam by a blinded cardiologist, followed by an echocardiogram. The authors defined aortic stenosis to be moderate or worse if the peak aortic gradient was equal to or greater than 26 millimeters of mercury. Regarding S2, they specifically looked at a diminished or absent aortic component, as well as a reversed split. The sensitivity and specificity of a diminished or absent A2 was 78 and 98 percent respectively, from which we can calculate a phenomenal positive likelihood ratio of 43 and a more modest but still helpful negative likelihood ratio of 0.23. In other words, if this finding was present in a patient with a systolic ejection murmur, that patient was extremely likely to have moderate or severe aortic stenosis. For a reverse split of S2, the sensitivity and specificity were 44 and 84 percent respectively, from which we can calculate a positive likelihood ratio of 2.8 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.66. These numbers are a bit more modest, but still are a little helpful. One source of information on the diagnostic utility of S3 can be found in a chapter from Steve McGee's excellent textbook, Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis. McGee summarizes a varied group of studies and combines together their data to provide pooled likelihood ratios for several measures of heart failure based on the presence or absence of an S3. This statistical technique has some important limitations, but nonetheless, here is the relevant subset of his data. As you can see, the sensitivity of the S3 for either low ejection fraction or elevated left-sided filling pressures is less than its specificity. This translates into helpful positive likelihood ratios, but negative likelihood ratios that are less so. Or as some people would put it, an S3 is helpful when it's present, but not helpful when it's absent. One of the best sources of information on the diagnostic utility of abnormalities um, of S3 and S4 is a review paper from JAMA in 2005, which looked at a variety of symptoms, exam findings, and diagnostic tests to determine the likelihood that a person who had come into the emergency department with shortness of breath had congestive heart failure. They synthesized information from dozens of smaller studies for their review. Here is what they found. So among patients presenting to the ER with dyspnea, how good was the S3 at diagnosing or excluding CHF as a causative etiology? The sensitivity was 0.13 and the specificity was 0.99. This translated to a positive likelihood ratio of 11 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.88. In summary, the presence of an S3 greatly increased the chance that the patient had CHF, but its absence reduced the chance by only a statistically significant but negligible amount. This more or less mirrors uh, the findings that Steve McGee had summarized in his book. How about an S4? Um, how good is that at diagnosing or excluding CHF as a causative etiology of dyspnea in this population? The sensitivity was a dismal 5%, and the specificity was 97%. This translates to a positive likelihood ratio of 1.6 and a negative likelihood ratio of 0.98, neither of which were statistically significant. Therefore, the presence or absence of an S4 is not helpful at diagnosing or excluding CHF. And that's it. Uh, unfortunately, there is no additional significant and relevant evidence in the scientific literature that discusses the diagnostic utility of abnormalities of the heart sounds. This does not mean that an understanding and the ability to recognize these abnormalities are of no utility. If that had been the case, I certainly would not have bothered to put together this lecture. However, what it does mean is that we should be cautious about the overutilization or overreliance of these exam findings. As just one example of what I mean, uh, I would never make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension on the basis of the presence of a loud P2. However, if I heard a loud P2 in a patient with shortness of breath or with chronic lung disease, I would certainly examine that patient for other signs of pulmonary hypertension, uh, 
would review their EKG more closely for indicators of right ventricular hypertrophy and have a lower threshold for ordering a more established means of diagnosis, such as an echocardiogram. The relative lack of scientific evidence concerning the diagnostic utility of heart sounds also underscores the need for additional research in this area, as the physical exam has many advantages over routine echocardiograms for every patient with the most mild of cardiopulmonary symptoms, which seems to have become relatively routine in the current era of diminished physician-patient contact and skyrocketing healthcare costs. That concludes this lecture on heart sounds. I hope you found this to be interesting and useful. If watching this on YouTube, please feel free to like, share, or comment on. You may also be interested in other videos on this channel, particularly a similar one on heart murmurs.